Hi folks, welcome to the series of arousal. So, obviously you will probably know there are, there are very or well, many different types of arousal. What we're talking about here in sports psychology is this, the type of arousal that is the intensity of your motivation and the fact that this arousal level can have positive and negative impacts and your psychological arousal, which is what this is, is your readiness to perform. So, there are four general theories on arousal and how it affects performance in sport. Drive theory, inverted U theory, catastrophe, and peak flow. Now, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, the higher your arousal level, the better you must perform, because the higher my arousal, the greater my readiness to perform. One theory suggests that, other, theory, other theories say it's slightly different to that. So that's the kind of point of this topic. We're going to look at these four theories and see exactly what the relationship is between arousal level and the level of your performance. So the first theory we're going to look at then is Hull's drive theory named after psychologist Hull, just simply known as drive theory. And as you can see from this graph, it's fairly, rel well, it seems relatively straightforward. As arousal level increases, so it goes from low to high arousal levels, your performance also goes from low to high. So in other words, the higher your arousal level, the higher your performance standard. So that does conform to what a lot of people think. And I've stated that there. As arousal increases, performance improves. However, it's got to be a little bit more precise than that. What Hull said, who developed drive theory, says that as your arousal increases, we're more likely to see a dominant response also known as well-learned behaviour. So your dominant response is what you will do in a situation, you know, i.e. your dominant response. If, if a skill is well-learned, the dominant response will be correct. If the skill is poorly learned, then the dominant response is likely to be incorrect. So like, what does it mean? Well, it means a dominant response of an experienced performer is likely to be correct. Someone who is experienced has learned the skills very, very well, Therefore, their dominant responses in all situations are likely to be the correct response. The dominant response of a novice, a beginner, someone who is new to a sport, is likely to be incorrect. So what we're actually saying here is, as arousal increases, performance gets better as long as you are an experienced performer. Because what we're saying is, as arousal increases, you're more likely to produce a dominant response and your dominant response is more likely to be correct if you are experienced and well-trained than if you are a novice. So to finish off with this one, as a result, experienced performers will want high arousal levels, whereas novices will want low arousal levels. And a lot of people know this, you know, when do you blood your youngsters into your team? Often in front of a home crowd, often in a small, you know, smaller crowd, smaller venue. How many Premier League teams give first team debuts to their youngsters when it's third round of the FA Cup away playing in front of 3,000 fans. This is lower arousal levels and that will suit a novice to that situation a little bit better than it will highly experienced performer. So that's my theory. Don't start getting panicky on this slide. It's just the straightforward, trust me. Inverted you, often been a big gripe of mine. I don't know why. No doubt someone will add a comment as to why it is. Why is it not just called N theory? Because an inverted you is just an N. But anyway, it's not inverted U theory. Basically, what this says is as arousal increases, so does performance up to a certain point. So what we're seeing here is, again, as arousal increases, my performance improves up to where we get to optimal arousal level. OK, so what we've got here is what some people like to call a zone of optimum functioning. If I can get my arousal level in here somewhere, I am going to get peak performance. I'm going to be performing at my best. However, a further increase in arousal leads to a decrease in performance as the performer becomes over aroused, hence why we now start coming down the curve. So to recap, as arousal increases, performance gets better and better and better. I get to optimal arousal level where my performance is at its peak, but then my performance starts to drop as, I, uh, as, as arousal continues to increase. So you might see that in games where I don't know, a rugby player in a big game starts to get a little bit too wound up and starts to do lots of knock-ons or start to miss the passes. Or you may even be in that situation yourself where you feel like you've had to force something because this result really matters, it's really important, and that's led to more and more errors. And this is where this term comes in, 
over aroused. So a further increase in arousal level leads to a decrease in performance as the performer becomes over aroused. Right here, my arousal level is too high because it's having a negative effect on my performance. It's now starting to dip. Now, obviously, it's not as straightforward as that in terms of it doesn't just apply to everyone. You might think I'm more drive theory. You know, I, I think I'm one of these people that applies to drive theory more. You might think actually this describes me pretty well. But obviously, there are other factors to consider. All we've got here are two inverted U's, one next to each other, but there's arousal level and there's performance again. So exactly the same as what we've got here. But why have we got two inverted U's like offset with each other? Well, what we're seeing here is low arousal levels, i.e. this first inverted U here, where arousal levels are between low and moderate, they're often preferred by novices or those performing fine or complex skills or your introvert personality types, your quiet people, shy people, individual people. Those three things in particular require low, no higher than moderate arousal levels to get the best performance. Whereas your expert performers, those skills that are simple or gross and don't require that much refinement, and your extroverts, your lively sociable people, they prefer moderate to high arousal levels in order to get into their zone of optimum arousal. So those factors can affect your personality type, the skill level or the complexity of the skill and you know the level of the performer can affect uh, your inverted U theory. So that again is something else to think about. Should you get a question saying what are the factors that affect inverted U or how does the personality type affect the inverted U? Those are the kind of things that you've got to be thinking about. We're not all just on one of these curves. There might be many, many inverted U curves. And these three factors dominate which, you know, where our arousal level needs to be in order to get us into our zone of optimal arousal. Now, thirdly, what we're on to now is catastrophe theory. Now, this is a version of inverted U. And the first part follows inverted U, as I've seen there. What do I mean by that? Well, as arousal level increases, performance gets better and better and better up to a zone of optimal arousal. So let's draw it in again. There is our zone of optimal arousal once again where we want to be. So we want our arousal levels to be there so we kind of get to that highest level of performance we can get to. Exactly the same as inverted U, what we've just done. However, instead of saying as arousal continues to increase or if arousal gets higher, there is a gradual fall in performance like there was with inverted U. This one says that should you become over aroused, there is a dramatic drop in performance, a sheer vertical drop. And when that happens, it is a catastrophe to your performance. There is a sudden and dramatic fall in the level of your performance. Now, this is linked to something that we've mentioned previously on another uh, video, cognitive and somatic anxiety. Cognitive is to do with the brain. So this is anxiety in the mind, worry, panic, fear, things like that. Whereas somatic, you might remember from GCSE, somatotypes, where you were endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorphs. So somatotype refers to the body or your physiology. So somatic anxiety, whoops, sorry, something just shifted is physiological anxiety, things to do with the body. So we've got there sweating, trembling, shaking, things like that, the signs that you are physically nervous. Now, the, the, the general principle is this. If you have high cognitive and somatic anxiety levels, so if you are anxious psychologically, mentally, and physiologically, you are going to have a catastrophic drop in performance. You are going to suffer that. You are going to see a massive drop in performance because you have got over aroused because your cognitive and somatic anxiety levels have got high and have led to you being over aroused. If your cognitive anxiety is high, so your mental anxiety, but your somatic anxiety is low, you will still produce good, good standards. So you can be worried, you can be panicky, but as long as your body's in control and you've got good technique, you know, you'll still produce to a good standard. Uh, and if your arousal levels reduce, should you should you have a catastrophe, should you have a sudden dramatic increase in cognitive and somatic anxiety, um, should your arousal levels reduce after the catastrophe, you can recover your performance, but it is very unlikely you will get back to optimal levels. So that's kind of the trade-off. So the reality is, 
If cognitive and somatic both increase, you're going to get catastrophe theory. If cognitive anxiety increases, you, so you're worried, you're nervous, but your somatic anxiety stays low, you're still in control of your actions and your technique, you'll still produce a good performance. But if you do go into catastrophe theory, we can recover that performance should you manage to reduce your arousal levels, but you're not going to get it back to optimal levels. And finally then, the fourth theory, peak flow. Now, you might go, this looks very different to ones we've done. It, it is a little bit. It's, it's quite a, a unique one in terms of this, in terms of it's not arousal and performance on the axes. It's two other axes. It's skill level and it's challenge. You will know this uh, as something else. When athletes say they are in the zone, or when you've even said it before in the past, I was in the zone. Peak flow theory is when you are in the zone, and that is what this flow channel is here. If you have got flow, you are in the zone. So this, this, this being in the zone is the same as your flow channel here. So I'll do like a little terrible, absolutely awful arrow there to indicate that that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, this one is, even though it doesn't look like any of the others, related to all the previous theories of arousal what we mean by that is if you're going to get peak flow in your flow channel or in the zone whichever you prefer the performer must be motivated enough so you've got to be at optimal arousal level so you've got to be either in that zone of optimal arousal if you're looking at catastrophe or inverted you or you've got to have a high arousal level if you're an extrovert or you're an experienced performer or it's a simple skill or you've got to have lower arousal levels if you're an introvert or if it's a complex skill, or if you're a novice performer, if we're talking about drive theory. So we've got to have the right motivation. And that means not being bored by the challenge, but also not being anxious by it. In a nutshell, what am I talking about? What am I whittering on about? There's very few instances where you're going to find yourself bang on in the zone. I'm going to be in the zone when my skill level, okay, matches the challenge, i.e. the quality of my opponent. So if my skill level is low, my opponent has got to be of a similar standard to me, i.e. my challenge has got to be uh, around about the same level as my own individual skill level. If my skill level is medium, again, my challenge needs to be, or my challenge yeah, needs to be of the same standard of me. So what we're seeing here is, for example, if you are playing, or sorry, if you have a very, very high skill level, so you're here, but you are playing someone who is not very good, you're going to be in the boredom zone. You're going to be bored and fed up, and therefore you're not going to find yourself in the zone. Equally, if we find ourselves that I have a lower skill level than my opponent, who is much better than me, I'm going to find myself in the anxiety zone. I'm going to find myself anxious and wound up. So if I'm anxious or if I'm bored, I'm not going to be in the zone. My ability level, my skill level, has got to be closely matched by that of my performer, therefore I will be motivated to try and succeed. And that's where I'll find myself in peak flow or in the zone. And just finally to finish on, this is also mentioned in the textbooks, it's also mentioned in the syllabus, this idea of this reticular activating system or your RAS. Here's a little diagram. The RAS filters and prioritizes sensory information so that the mind be focused and alert. Right, the reticular activating system exists in your brainstem essentially, it's this little green thing here. Now, what it does is the RES, the, retic the reticular activating system, maintains your arousal levels. So it enhances or inhibits sensory information. So it can increase your arousal level or it can decrease your arousal level. Now, what we generally find is extroverts, those of you who have an extrovert personality type, you tend to inhibit the intensity of stimuli. So your RES tends to inhibit sensory information, i.e. reduce it. So as a result, you seek out high arousal situations to try and maximise the number of stimuli and maximise the amount of sensory information to compensate and make up for that. In contrast to that, introverts, you introverts, tend to increase the intensity of the stimuli. So your RAS boosts the intensity of the stimuli. That is why you introverts seek out low arousal situations because you're already, weirdly, quite aroused already psychologically, cognitively, whatever you want to call it. So there's this obviously where like obviously physiology meets psychology a little bit. So that could also be worth mentioning some of your answers. Obviously you could get short answer questions on each of these topics. Two or three marks on drive theory, two or three marks on catastrophe, two or three marks on the RAS, what it does and how it relates to personality type. Or you could get a big question, a marker, a marker, talking about the theories of arousal 
and how you know arousal affects performance in which case you mention everything on this presentation and don't be afraid to draw diagrams in your exam as long as you label the graphs correctly and as long as you describe the pattern of the graph and what is going on okay so that's everything on arousal hope you found this video useful folks